Welcome to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider, where legal experts tear down contracts from some of the most well-known companies and high-profile executives around the world. In this episode, privacy expert Avishai Ostrin tears down Slack's data processing addendum. So let's tear it down. Avishai Ostrin, welcome to the Contract Teardown Show. How are you today, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited because we are talking about uh, maybe my least favorite uh, software tool I, right behind Twitter. Okay, I'm not going to rant about Twitter because uh, I don't emotionally need to go through that. Uh, we are talking about Slack, uh, specifically this data processing addendum. I'm going to show this to the folks at home. Avishai, what is this thing that we're looking at? Okay, so in order to understand what a data processing addendum is, we, we need to understand two basic concepts in privacy. Number one is the data controller. Number two is the data processor. So the data controller will be your company that's using Slack. The data processor will be Slack. And basically, the company is saying to Slack, we are putting information into the platform. We're entrusting you with this information. And the data processing addendum, or as we call it in the industry, the DPA, will say what Slack is allowed to do with it, with that data, how they can use it, what their responsibilities are towards me, the company, what they have to do when contract is over, et cetera. Yeah, we're third-partying responsibilities, which is always sticky. So uh, as we dig into this, uh, tell us about you, Avishai. What's your background? What brings you to documents like this? Yeah, so uh, my background, I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I'm actually qualified both in Israel and in the UK, um, and I work for a company called Privacy Team, and what we offer is a very, very unique service to the technology uh, sector. Um, we offer a service called DPO, so Data Protection Officer. Um, some companies are required uh, by regulation to appoint a DPO, others choose to do it in order to sort of um, get their compliance in order. Um, and basically what that means is that we're in charge of everything privacy related within the company. Um, so anything that has to do with uh, personal data, um, how it's used, where it's stored, very, very sort of involved in the technology aspects. And one of the things that we do quite frequently is draft, review, comment on, negotiate, whatever verb you want to put in there, uh, DPAs data processing agreements. Data Perfect. Processing You're, that makes you the right kind of nerd for this thing. So uh, let's dig into it. I, I'm looking at this document. And uh, for those who are not familiar somehow, Slack is a place where you could do inter office communications. There are ways that it can, it's been used in other ways for like communities and things like that. But the point is, there's a lot of company information going on to this software tool. And so if I'm understanding correctly, and I want to get uh, you to give me some feedback on the background of this thing, but if I'm understanding correctly, the idea here is I, as a company, I've hired Slack, but I have responsibilities in Europe and in California and around the world to protect data. I have a bunch of rules, but now I'm trusting these weirdos in Silicon Valley to, uh, to with my responsibility. It, it, this, it seems to me, is trying to solve, you know, lay out the rules for that kind of a relationship. Am I understanding what a DPA is correctly? Give me the background on the thing. Right. So yeah, that's exactly right. If you think think about, for example, um, you have a bunch of money laying around and you go to an institution called a bank, right? And what we want to make sure is we want to make sure that when you give the bank the this money, um, they're, they're holding it properly. They're not misusing it. They're not giving it to people they shouldn't be giving it to. They're holding it on your behalf and doing with it what you would want them to do with it. And that's basically the equivalent of what we have here um, just with a with with data, so they're holding your data, um, and and they need to do uh, what you require them to do through this this contract, this DPA. Perfect. Uh, so let's talk about it. I I I sort of like the way they do the. The, this layout, I, I don't know if the folks at home are going to be able to see this, but they have sort of a, um, a data entry. They, they do it almost like a document automation tool that uh, you can go and you can sign it. So to be clear, they are creating 
the the data processing addendum that you are going to sign as the company owner. Uh, they, they've got good background, a bunch of definitions, but we're going to slide down uh, to number personal data. Let's go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, we're in one in the conversation about personal data and also into two into how they process it. Give us some of the language in here that you're looking at and, and do you like how they're referring to personal data and, and the ideas about how they're processing it? Yeah, so that's exactly right, Mike. I think what what you said is is it's important to to uh, note here that that Slack is in fact, as do many large companies, right? They're going to be dictating the terms on which they are processing data on your behalf. So sort of the the, the scales are a little bit tipped, I would say, in the in in big tech's favor, as it often is, and that's why we need to take a look at this critically and say, okay. Are they drafting it too much in their favor and make sure that we're, you know, we're getting into the weeds on that and making sure that we're protecting our interests uh, appropriately. So as you said, the first thing we're going to get into is the definition of personal data. So if you look at the definition section, um, so they talk about customer data that relates to an identified or identifiable natural person. So very, very, very broad, any data that relates to an individual. If, you, uh, if we then sort of scroll down the connected uh, uh, clause would be 2.4, which is the details of processing. And basically what we're trying, our goal here when we approach this part of the DPA is to understand what it applies to. Okay, so we know it applies to personal data, which is roughly speaking, any data that relates to an individual. So Mike Whelan, Avishai Ostrin, not, Company Inc. Okay, so that's the differentiation there. And then the details of processing in 2.4 and then complete, which is completed then in Schedule 3, will tell us, uh, sorry, Schedule 2, will tell us what type of information they're processing. So if we scroll all the way down to page number 15, we'll see um, what categories, so the first thing we have is categories of data subjects whose personal data is transferred. So if you think about the Slack platform, what you're saying to yourself, what type of personal data will Slack be processing? Well, it's any information about the people who are communicating via Slack, plus any information that they input about other people. So for example, if Mike and Avishai are communicating via Slack, they'll have Avishai's information, and they'll have Mike's information. Um, and so if you look at the categories of data subjects, they'll have, you know, the authorized users, which are people who are authorized to use the system, the employers, the consultants, the contractors, the agents, et cetera, et cetera. All of those types of individuals' data will be processed within this system. Um, the categories of the personal data is you know, as it says here, any personal data comprised in customer data as defined in the agreement. So that's sort of a very broad definition to say it's anything that you guys decide to put in the system. And that's very common. We see that a lot, particularly with SaaS technology. So software as a service technology, where they're saying, here's a platform, do with it whatever you want. We have no control over what data you put into the platform. It's whatever you use the platform for. And so that's why there are these broad definitions. Um, and then we can sort of go through this as well, the, um, whether there are any special categories of data, frequency of the transfer, nature of the processing, et cetera, et cetera. And so just yeah, to summarize- I, I want to take you back to, to kind of sure. ask you a, d a dumb question. When I look back at mm -hmm. personal data, you know, it, in the definitions, it says it means any customer data and customer data is is capitalized as if that's a defined term. It sounds like what you're saying is, let's assume if you've got an addendum, all right, uh, like by definition, then there's another document and presumably customer data is defined in in that other document. So am, am I right in understanding that you're not, this will never live on its own. It's going to live as part of a, a separate agreement that Slack probably wrote as well. Correct. That's 100% correct. You'll usually have a, uh, a main agreement, whether you're talking about a services agreement, uh, you'll have T's and C's if in the case of Slack, which is sort of an auto sign up kind of situation. Um, but absolutely right. It'll always refer back to the agreement. And oftentimes you'll see it also refers back to when it talks about what 
th what processing activities Slack is going to be doing, they're going to be doing the services that they agreed to in the agreement. So there's a lot of um, cross-referencing between, there'll be a lot of cross-referencing between those two documents. Um, and I think that you, you, you pointed to, um, you, you made a point about something that I think is also very important to, to make sure that we sort of uh, emphasize here, which is that one of the things that you need to make sure if you're reviewing these types of documents is we need to make sure that the data that, it, that Slack says that it's processing on your behalf is in fact the data, it makes sense to you. So if there's something in here that looks like, hey, wait a second, if you're, if you're, you know, you're saying to yourself, hmm, they talk about racial and ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, things like, you know, very, very sensitive type of data, then you might say to yourself, well, you know, Slack says we have no control over whether someone, you know, says, you know, I, my political opinion is X, but then you might want to take, if, if that's something that's, that's an issue for you, you might want to take sort of mitigating steps to say, hey, wait a second, don't, don't put any of that sense. You might want to instruct your workforce, for example, you might want to say, hey, guys, Let's just make sure not to put any sensitive data in this system because then they'll be they'll be processing it on our behalf and that might be an issue. So and, it's just yeah, sort and of it's so interesting because it, sorry, it's so interesting to my earlier point. I like I've seen this used not just for companies, I've seen it used for communities, for uh, like social groups who are getting together. And so whatever the context is, if you're trying to optimize for a work context, that's an interesting decision for Slack. But you mentioned the word processing. I, I, again, define term. The word processing yeah. means something. Uh, they're referring to, in their definitions, any operation or set of operations which is performed upon the personal data, whether or not by automatic or if somebody actually did something. So I, I'm looking down at 2.3. It gives some of the guidelines for processing the personal data. Again, feels very broad. We're going to do the thing with the thing and all the things that we do. It's ours to do the thing with. What do you think about the language in 2.3? Yeah, so I, I agree that oftentimes, um, again, with these SaaS platforms where, you know, Slack is saying to, the, to, to, to you, to the customer, is saying to you, listen, I don't know what you're going to do with this system, right? You could take it, you could, you know, be, be running the, you know, the, the next, uh, I don't know, you could, you could be running a, a plot of some sort of criminal enterprise on Slack. I have no control. You, you know, that's completely up to you. So we'll process whatever data you put, you input there. But interestingly, if you look at 2.3, um, there's some very interesting language in here. And in, in fact, what's interesting is something that's, that I, I believe is missing in here. So if you look at 2.3, it says they're gonna process the data in accordance with the agreement, okay? They're providing you the services that's laid out in the agreement. So in accordance with the agreement or the applicable order form. Processing initiated by authorized users in the use of the service. So if you, Mike, are entering a message into Slack, that's, you know, you're inputting the personal data. And then number three, processing to comply with other reasonable instructions uh, provided by customer. Okay, so um, uh, if, if uh, your company, Mike, that's using Slack um, says, hey, give me all of the copies of all of my data, then that would be an instruction provided by the customer that they have to comply with. What I feel that's missing in this clause that we often see in DPAs and I don't see here are two very important um, uh, additional sort of purposes. Um, number one is what's missing here is processing in accordance with a legal obligation. So there might be an instance where uh, law enforcement comes and says to Slack, hey guys, we have suspicion that Mike's running a criminal enterprise through Slack. Can you give me all of his uh, uh, communications? You know, we'll, 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 we'll set that, the legality and all the legal issues around that aside, but that would be a form of processing and I'm surprised that it's not here. And then the other one that's a little bit more on the commercial side is, um, Slack and any other technology platform will want to use insights from its platform in order to improve its platform, right? I w Slack wants to say, hey, I see that people are, you know, um, connecting in this way, using Slack in a different way, 
Um, I see that this type of chat, this type of group chat is more, uh, um, you know, more uh, used more, or this type of prompt actually, you know, causes a certain type of behavior. And so we want to use those insights in order to improve the system. Um, that's obviously uh, uh, processing, or at least anonymizing that data so that they can use it is a form of processing. And I'm surprised that they don't have that in here because oftentimes we'll see processing in order to gain insights to improve the software. So I'm actually surprised that that's not in here, um, but you know that's generally what that what we're looking for in that type of a, a, a clause. Gotcha. Well, you see, you company are trusting Slack with data that you are responsible for. Slack also trusts other companies with the data that you are responsible for. This is down in section four, subprocessors and four one. They note they're gonna use other companies. There's gonna be other companies involved and it says at the end of the, the that section, uh, if you enter into the standard contractual clauses, then you grant a general written authorization to Slack to appoint subprocessors in accordance with section nine. Uh, what do you think of this section, uh, section four, talking about the appointment of subprocessors and the use of subprocessors? Are they handling this well? Yeah. So as as you said, it's it's pretty much impossible to have this type of a uh, a service like Slack without having uh, subprocessors. You know, the the most basic one that we're used to seeing is the cloud service provider, right? They're hosting it in the cloud somewhere, whether it's Google or Amazon or whatever. You know, that's your basic one that, that we're used to seeing everywhere. But just as you say, Mike, your company is entrusting Slack. Slack is entrusting a third party. Um, ultimately, company will be responsible if something happens with the data once it's entrusted to that third party. And therefore, um, Slack must notify company about the appointment of subprocessors. What's the uh, what's the sort of game or the issue I would say that that often um, comes up with the with with um, drafting these types of, um, of of clauses that are very often sort of uh, meticulously drafted is that on the one hand Slack has an obligation to notify company hey we're using a sub a new subprocessor we're changing our our list whatever and and gain the authorization but on the other hand you can't really build the technology platform when if you're going to appoint a new subprocessor, you're going you're to have to come run to your hundreds, thousands of, of clients, of customers and say to them, hey, we're, we're going to appoint a new subprocessor. Is that cool with you? And so that's where, because that's just not a scalable option. So there's that obligation on the one hand, but the scalability sort of um, clashes with that a little bit on the other hand. And so what we see here um, is very common where they say, okay, we're going to give you notification. Okay. And then we'll, we'll always, the lawyers love to sort of argue, is it going to be 10 days? Is it going to be 15 days? Is it going to be 30 days? We all love, you know, to get into the minutia. Um, but the principle remains the same. We're going to give you notification and the right to object if you object to the appointment of a specific subprocessor. And that's exactly, um, that's exactly what they have here. Some more sophisticated actors like Slack will actually have a subscription uh, option. So you can subscribe on their website to receive any updates for subprocessor appointments. Um, and that's it, that makes it even easier for them to do that. Um, and, then, and then the question is, once they notify, if you object, what happens then? What's the recourse? Usually what they'll do is they'll say, um, you know, we'll, we'll try to find a solution for you without that using that um, subprocessor that, we're, that you're objecting to. And if not, you'll have the right to terminate the agreement. Um, obviously, fees can be argued about whether they do have to pay fees, the fees up until the date of termination. Don't have to pay the fees up until the date of termination. But generally speaking, um, if the, the way they'll do it is they'll say, if you're silent on it, after a certain time, that's deemed acceptance, and then um, and then you're 
you know, we're, we're good to use that subprocessor. So very, very standard what I'm seeing here uh, in terms of notification, right to object uh, within a certain amount of time, um, and then what happens, termination right in case you the object, objection uh, can't be remedied. Got it. Well, eventually you're going to cancel Slack, uh, theoretically. Uh, your company might end. You might move to some other platform. Section 8 talks about that, the return and deletion of personal data. Pretty short paragraph. Basically says, you leave, we kill the data, have a nice life. Uh, what do you think about the way they're handling this? Is this is this the right way to handle the end of the relationship as regards to, to as it uh, pertains to the data? Yeah, so so this this is a pretty standard clause, and actually, um, you know, there's always a debate sort of in 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 our industry in terms of um, what does it mean to return data? Am I just going to like send you a huge file with PDFs, or how's how exactly? We got to get part? the floppy disk. We got to go back to the you know the <laughs> slidey floppy right. disk. Some of exactly. you kids listening to this don't remember, don't know why the save symbol looks like it does. But there used to be a thing called disks. Let's just send those around to people. Exactly, exactly. Or, or you'll just get a hard drive with all of your with all of your information on it. Um, but again, the the issue that we talked about with the subprocessor clause comes up here again, um, which is scalability. Right? We need to be able to build a product where as many where we have as many self serve functions as possible. Which is why. Um, uh, which is why what um, Slack is saying is um, is they'll they'll generally and 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 s services like Slack will say okay at the end of the contract if you want your data back we'll give you like a self serve option that says okay export all my data to a CSV file something like that and you can download it um, if you want to delete it you can give us a notification and we'll we'll delete it from our system. Um, but again, that's sort of one that um, is is oftentimes uh, we'll see negotiation of it. Um, is it within a certain time period within the termination of the agreement? Um, who bears the cost? So you see here, for example, Slack put in a clarification. For clarification, depending on the service plan purchased by the customer, access to export functionality may incur additional charges and or require purchase of a service upgrade. So they're saying, listen, company, we're happy to let you export your data, but that costs us money. And that's something that you're going to have to uh, pay for. And that's, you know, we see that with a lot of the obligations throughout the DPA is that there's sort of this play between the um, legal obligation. Uh, they'll say, yes, we have an obligation to let you, for example, audit us. We have an obligation to assist you with anything. But hey, if, if that's going to cost us a lot of money, then you know, you're going to have to pay for it. And it's no different here. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, this is, this is pretty standard language here, I would say. Um, you know, you might, you might have the security team wanting to ask them how they're going to uh, destroy the data, how they're going to delete it, whether they have, um, you know, policies in place, uh, in place for that, maybe in their security documentation. Um, but that's uh, that's generally what we'll see with the return and deletion clause. You gotta light those floppy disks on fire. Uh, let me tell you, Abishai, why Slack bugs me, and it, because it's actually relevant to the bigger picture that we're talking about with this kind of document, this kind of transaction. I have often said that Slack combines the inefficiency of email with the pressure of social media. And that's actually its strength, right? It, it takes business communications and turns it into the kind of communications that we do in our daily lives in hopes that it will build more collaboration across teams. But the fact that it bridges both those contexts means you got all kinds of weird users on there. They have a product-led growth strategy, which means they want people just to use the free version of it, start building something, and eventually get there. What's interesting then is you know, just to make a fake number, 
80% of their users are not larger businesses, but probably 80% of their revenue comes from those remaining uh, customers who, in fact, are large businesses. So, so they're sort of being a platform means that they're serving these kind of two masters at the same time. One is this, okay, we're going to be very structured. We're going to have an onboarding team. We're going to do, we're going to have a long sales process. You're going to know exactly what you're doing. Let's get it. And then there's going to be a bunch of other weirdos like us who just have a, a tiny company or we're in a Dungeons and Dragons game group or something and and we're on slack to communicate as a drafting exercise that seems really hard because you don't know if i'm doing a dpa do i have to worry about you know exxon mobil getting on here and having some corporate secrets or do i have to worry about these dungeons and dragons larping people get on there and turning into a a a coup that's going to take over their uh, uh, south american government like Drafting seems really difficult in this context. How do you draft as a platform knowing all kinds of weirdos are going to be playing with this thing? Okay, so, so, so that's an excellent question. I do actually have a, a, a word to say in defense of Slack, but I'll keep it to the end. I promise I, promise I will retort, but I'll keep that to the end. Fine, fine, I'll, fine. Answer, I'll, 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 answer, I'll answer your question first. I think it's, it's, it's a very, very good question. And we always have this, um, uh, we always have this sort of debate about how, you know, how do you draft to try to cover all scenarios? And I think that there's something, in some ways, there's something very liberating about just saying, you know, I, I don't need to cover all scenarios. Let me cover, uh, you know, let me sort of think of uh, uh, the basics. And I think that. Actually, the, the regulation, we didn't really talk about the privacy regulations here that I'm sure the listeners are familiar with. If I say the words um, GDPR, they won't think that I'm yelling um, no, sure. you know, yeah. foreign, foreign, a foreign language at them uh, uh, or CCPA or things like that. Um, but the regulations actually prescribe what types of uh, um, sections need to be here in the DPA. And so... Um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say, okay, you need to deal with deletion, you need to deal with what data is, is applicable. So they'll give you the structure, they'll give you sort of the skeleton of what the DPA uh, needs to include. And then you just need to say, okay, you know, in, 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 in the same way you're drafting any other contract, how am I going to make sure that I'm protecting my client's interest um, while still, you know, uh, uh, complying with the regulatory requirements. You and, know, I, I yeah. actually, I want to put a pin in that because that's super interesting because what a lot of these technology companies, if they're seeking this platform space, will do is they'll say, we know there's a legal risk, but we're going to roll with it because yeah. winning in this space is such a huge win. And we're pretty confident that regulators are going to come figure stuff out later. So I, to a degree, I feel like they're kind of drafting broadly and running with their business and doing yeah. their thing and accepting more risk than you might if you only had five clients and, and you know, you're just trying to survive out there. I think that's probably accurate. I think also, you know, you'll, you'll you know, it, these types of companies, uh, you know, SaaS platforms will always have acceptable use policies. Um, they'll tell you, you know, don't don't put, um, you know, don't put the data on our system if you think that it's, you know, don't don't abuse our system, don't use it for, you know, for nefarious uh, for nefarious things, and they'll have that policy. Um, and as, as we know in um, you know, I, I, I was a contract lawyer before and a, and a commercial lawyer before I, I, I was even I even gone into privacy many, many years ago. Um, and, you know, oftentimes in contract drafting, it is about um, it's it's about allocating risk. It's about saying, wait a second, I'm going to I'm going to draft this in a way so that if someone abuses it, they, I, I may not be able to technically prevent them from abusing the product. But I will be able to mitigate some of my liability by saying, you know, I, I told them that this isn't what the platform was meant for. Um, and, and, and here are my terms. They're very clearly laid out. Also, you know, the other thing to remember here is that Slack is very clearly intended for there are individuals that use it, but it's very clearly branded and intended for business use. Um, that's their, you know, their, their entire branding is around that. 
Um, and this actually brings me to my defense of Slack, um, which is, which is um, you're going to have, in, your employees are going to communicate about work-related issues um, outside of email. That's just a given. Um, and email is something that the organization, you know, if it's a work email, the organization has control over and can, you know, within reason can, can monitor and can, you know, if an employee leaves, they can, um, you know, uh, uh, access the historical uh, correspondence if they need it for, you know, for, for, in order to do the business. Um, so if, if it's a given that your employees are going to be talking about work related issues outside of email and outside of, you know, face to face conversations, you need a platform that will allow you to allow them that simplicity, but also give you as a business the ability to sort of control that um, the access to that information. Now, I'm not talking about sort of surveillance and, and, and tracking users and things like that. I'm not talking about that. What I am talking about is, and I've even seen this in, you know, the time that I've worked at Privacy Team, we've had um, team members who've left. And if we were communicating over text message or over WhatsApp, which is very uh, commonly used here, here in, uh, in Tel Aviv, um, then, you know, we, we, we wouldn't have access to that to that information and we do because it's on a work managed environment so maybe not such so much a defense of slack because i because i understand the uh what you're saying um but sort of a, in defense of uh keeping work in the work environment um and you know healthy also for sort of the separation of the work life balance I think. yeah and i think i mean i think the larger point here is it is the nature of platforms, both contractually and administratively, that if you create a broad play space, which is kind of required for platforms as as a as a product, and then let people use and deal with the risk, you know it's not going to go perfectly, but but design for somebody. They they are designing for businesses. They are contracting for businesses, but they're also allowing for some space, uh, both contractually. In the end, it's probably as good as what you put into it. And I just maybe just don't have the. I'm too ADHD maybe for the learning curve. That's probably <laughs> the issue. Avishai, uh, I appreciate you hanging out with us. For people who want to learn more about uh, your privacy practice, what you do, what's the best way to connect with you? LinkedIn. Uh, just uh, look me up on LinkedIn. I'm very active there. Uh, you can follow me, send me a connection, send me a message. Very active on LinkedIn. Happy, always happy to chat. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. So that's the best place. Well, we will be sure to include a link to your profile over at lawinsider.com slash resources under the show notes for this, as well as a link to this document so that you can look at it. And if you want to be a guest on the Contract Teardown Show, just email us. We are at community at lawinsider.com. Abishai, thank you, and we'll see you all on the next Teardown. Thanks. Thanks very much, Frank. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.